Good evening, fellow Federationists, and welcome to our October presidential release. Happy Meet the Blind Month to everybody. I hope everybody enjoyed our music as we kick things off, especially that awesome song, My Vote, by our very own Precious Perez. We're so glad that all of you are here tonight. I hope everybody is taking part in our poll via our, if you're using Zoom in, on the web or in our app. And we're so glad that all of you are here tonight with us. It is now my pleasure to introduce for his remarks tonight, our president, Rick Abono, who will be sharing with us what's happening in the National Federation of the Blind and how we are continuing to make a difference. President Rick Abono. Hey, Pam, how are you feeling tonight? I'm doing great, how about you? I'm doing great, thank you very much. Thank you for those excellent song picks too. Yeah. Great way to kick things off. <laughs> Hey, I, I heard a rumor that to, uh, today is the anniversary for the uh, center. Is that true? That is true. We are very proud. 35, 35. years. Yes, sir. 35 oh. years, changing lives, helping <laughs> blind people live the lives they want. So we put a shout out to our founder, Joanne Wilson, and to all of the awesome present and past and future students and staff at the Louisiana <laughs> Center for the Blind, and most importantly, the members of the National Federation of the Blind to make it all happen. I'm, I'm, for sure, your support too, I'm sure. I'm sure Oriana will be ringing her. Uh, I know bell. she will. I know she will. Uh, thanks, Pam. Should we get started? Yes, sir. We're ready. All right. Great. Greetings, fellow Federationists. Today is Thursday, October one, two thousand twenty, and this is Presidential Release four hundred ninety-eight. Welcome to Meet the Blind Month. And uh, first and foremost, I do want to remind everybody to go out and vote. I know we talked a lot about voting on last month's release, but uh, we can't say it too much. Uh, voter registration deadlines are uh, approaching this month in many places across the country. And so if you're not registered to vote and you haven't planned how you're going to vote in uh, this election, uh, please do so. I was impressed by the stats from last month's poll at the presidential release, how many people, a uh, huge percentage of eligible voters in our release were planning to vote. You can find resources and information uh, about uh, states and what's available in states for voting by going to nfb.org slash vote. And uh, you can also find voting and election resources on our NFB Newsline system. This is available to all subscribers, including um, those subscribers who live in states that do not currently have sponsors. So uh, go find the voter information you need and uh, please plan to vote in this election by one of the means available. Also a reminder that we will have a blind voters survey 
that'll be out in the next week or so and available for you to complete once you've filled out uh, your ballot and submitted it, whether you've done it early, whether you've done it by mail, whether you do it uh, at the polling place on election day, whether your experience is good or bad, please fill out our blind voter survey. It helps us in our advocacy efforts to continue to move closer and closer to full equal access to a secret verifiable ballot for every single blind person in this country. I am pleased to announce that uh, we are again partnering with Lyft in their rideshare efforts to get uh, blind people uh, rides to the polls. We have uh, coupons being provided by Lyft to help people get to voting uh, places either early or on election day. Uh, if you want more information, if you're in need of one of those coupons in order to get to the poll, please reach out to your Federation affiliate president. They will have information about how to uh, give you a Lyft coupon code to get to the polls. All right, that's enough talk about voting. Let's talk about a few other things that are happening in and around the Federation. Uh, hopefully you've already seen that we released our NFB Newsline mobile app 3.0 which gives you all the access you're used to in terms of the general NFB Newsline features in a new streamlined format that we think will uh, you'll like. Our beta testers have uh, had a lot of success with it. And it also includes the basic functions of the KNFB reader. And so you should go download uh, from the iOS app store, the NFB Newsline, mobile 3.0 and get access to these great features and then tell us uh, what, what else we want in the NFB Newsline app so we can plan for the next iteration of this technology. If you're not currently an NFB Newsline subscriber or if you want more information about NFB Newsline, please go to nfbnewsline.org to get all that information. Our advocacy work continues in the National Federation of the Blind and um, it's reaching many new places and it's getting much more exposure than ever before. Uh, it, I'm proud that the United States Commission on Civil Rights last month released a report entitled Subminimum Wages Impacts on the Civil Rights of People with Disabilities. Uh, the report, the news around the report, uh, all are influenced by and have um, the traces of the National Federation of the Blind. Uh, we were prominently featured in testifying at the hearing, which actually happened last November. And this report um, is in, an important step toward moving the needle toward equal access and um, fair wages for all people with disabilities in America. So um, congratulations to all of our Federation family that helped um, make that report what it is. And now we need to socialize it and get our members of Congress to act on outlawing the discriminatory provisions of 14C in the Fair Labor Standards Act. We continue to make great strides in getting support for the Access Technology Affordability Act. I wanna give a special thanks to the Washington, Massachusetts and Ohio affiliates for gaining new ATAA co-sponsors in the House of Representatives. That brings our total House co-sponsors now to 128. I also wanna give special thanks to our New York and Kansas affiliates for gaining new co-sponsors for ATAA in the Senate. We have a total Senate co-sponsorship of 26. We can uh, up these numbers in the next month. Uh, we can get even closer as we get to election day and the stronger these numbers are, uh, the better. There still will be chances to pass um, this bill and potentially other bills of ours, but definitely this bill as the Congress considers some legislation and potentially in the lame duck session. But 
Regardless, our strong co-sponsor numbers are a reflection of the hard work of each and every one of you out there, and they will put us in a great position for what will happen in the next Congress. So pour on the pressure, especially as uh, Congress members come home to the district and before that. I have some exciting news around our work with our national division, our parents of blind children. You know, we're doing a, a lot of work to make sure that we can help um, connect and protect families as they uh, work to you know, have blind students connected online and getting access in the virtual environment. And for the first time this evening, we're announcing an important uh, partnership with Vespero. Uh, Vespero has committed to um, giving a free copy of the JAWS screen reader to every member of our national organization of parents of blind children. So you have to be a dues paying member of NOPBC to get this benefit. And uh, of course, if you're a parent out there and you're not yet a member of NOPBC, you're a parent of a blind child, we want you to join. And now because of the partnership with Vespero Freedom Scientific, you can get a free one year JAWS license. So I encourage you to uh, get right on that and take advantage of this great opportunity to get our students access. Um, if you want more information, and we're just launching this now right at this moment, so it'll be disseminated right after this release. But if you want more information right now, you can send an email to N-O-P, as in Paul or parent, B as in blind, C as in children, N-O-P-B-C, prez, P-R-E-Z, at gmail.com, N-O-P-B-C, P-R-E-S, at gmail.com. Very exciting, and thank you to Freedom Scientific and Vespero for that support. We're also going to be doing some community forum uh, next week to gather information about um, what's working, what's not working for parents of blind children in the virtual education that's happening around the country. Those are going to be on October 6 and October 8, respectfully. We want to uh, make sure that uh, we engage parents out there. Uh, we want to collect information about where the education is working well and where it's not and try to um, connect families together through our advocacy network to deal with that. You know, if we have kids right now who are um, in schools where they're using inaccessible technology, it's going to be hard to change it in the next week or two weeks or month or two months while the students are using this technology. But we can overcome some of that through our great resource network in the Federation. You can find out more information about these community forums and how to register. You can go on our website to register and look under our Parents of Blind Children section at nfb.org. Well, we've already mentioned it's October and that means Meet the Blind Month for the National Federation of the Blind. When we uh, hold activities both nationally and across the country in local communities, looking a little different, this year, but we still have this concentrated time to focus on reaching out to the general public and educating them about our capacity as blind people, telling the truth about blindness, getting our stories, our lived experiences heard and understood by uh, members of the public, by employers, by um, those that we're seeking to do business with, whatever the case, and in COVID-19, when um, a lot of people are taking advantage of more online resources and opportunities to learn, this is a great time for us to be advancing our public awareness campaign. The theme this year is in fact lived experiences with intersectionality and blindness. And um, that really um, allows us um, a forum to enhance what we've been trying to do in terms of advancing uh, the understanding that blindness 
um, along with other characteristics um, impact uh, a blind person's life and where it does and where it doesn't. And it will allow us to explore some of those intersectionalities and how um, the other disparities in society also impact blind people with diverse characteristics. You can go to nfb.org slash mtbm, that's for Meet the Blind Month, to get more information. And if uh, your local chapter and affiliates having events that we haven't yet posted to our calendar, you can send them via email. All the details about your event, we'll put it up. Send it to web at nfb.org. I'm looking forward to some great Meet the Blind Month uh, activities already. I've gotten some invitations to a number of them. I looked at the website today and looked at what interesting things federationists are doing. So um, keep up the great work. Think up some new activities. It's not too late. We got 30 days to go. And I know with the number of the fall conventions, I'm sure there'll be some interesting Meet the Blind Month activities. October 15th, of course, will be White Cane Awareness Day. And I know many affiliates are busy uh, trying to get proclamations and, and things like that, even in this um, uh, time of social distancing. It's a good opportunity though, to get out with your long white cane, take a picture of uh, you traveling around the community, post it on Facebook, of you traveling independently with your cane or guide dog. You know, it wasn't all that long ago that um, the notion of us having the right to travel in the world independently and uh, without uh, difficulty or being considered a um, nuisance uh, legally it wasn't that long ago. It was because of the work that the Federation did to get the laws changed, to raise expectations that that has changed. And so I encourage you to get out, especially on White Cane Awareness Day and exercise that freedom and independence and post about it on uh, Facebook and Twitter and use that as an opportunity also to promote our free White Cane program. Now, one of the things we've been doing around White Cane Awareness Day in the past few years is use that as our White Cane Giving Day. And uh, I mentioned Vespero, Freedom Scientific earlier, and um, I wanna mention them again because I recently had a opportunity to sit down with Tom Tiernan, CEO, and uh, to talk about the work that we have been doing together in the Federation with Vespero. And uh, in that conversation, you can watch the video we posted it today. Tom uh, dropped the idea on me that uh, Freedom Scientific would put up $50,000, matching dollars, if we can raise $50,000 for the National Federation of the Blind this month, in the month of October. And so we wanna take advantage of that. Uh, because that means every dollar that we can bring in this month will be $2. And we know that in this um, time where we're putting out a lot of resources to connect and protect blind people, we're expanding voting in so many places. We've been spinning up Zoom meetings, uh, hundreds of Zoom meetings, a lot of expenses we hadn't planned for. So these dollars are um, greatly appreciated. I wanna uh, give uh, a virtual applause uh, for Vespero Freedom Scientific for their continued support of the Federation and blind people. But we need to raise the dollars now to get that 50,000. So we need you to think about making a contribution for Meet the Blind Month for our White King Giving Day and to encourage others to do the same. We can get this money. We can fulfill this promise. There are three ways to give. You can give a gift yourself by going to nfb.org slash donate. Of course, you can always mail in your contribution to the National Federation of the Blind at 200 East Wells Street, Baltimore, Maryland, 21230. Or you can call and give your gift via phone. You can call our main number, 410-659-9314. You can press four when you get to the menu and follow the prompts and we will uh, get you connected with someone that can take your donation via phone. And I do encourage you to share information about this in social media 
why you made a gift, what it means to you, and uh, use the hashtag white cane giving in all of this so that we can encourage more people to know about the work that we're doing and to leverage this generous $50,000 contribution from Vespero Freedom Scientific. You again can go to nfb.org slash donate. I'd encourage you to share that page and I hope you'll consider a gift to make it possible for us to pull these dollars down. Okay, while we're talking money, uh, let's talk about the pre-authorized contribution program. Actually, I'll let other people talk about the PAC plan. Hey, everybody, it's Scott LeBar. And Ryan Strunk. And we are the Pac-Men. I bet that many of you thought we got gobbled up after the convention, but nope, we're still here. Definitely not How's ghosting it going, you. It's going well. So, uh, Ryan, I think most of the listeners to this live presidential release know what the PAC program is. But in case they don't, what is it? The PAC plan is our pre-authorized contribution plan, and it enables you to give on a monthly basis, and the funds are taken directly from your checking account or from your debit card without you having to think about it. It's like magic, and you don't even have to have a power pill first. Absolutely not. And you tell us how much you want to withdraw. The minimum amount is $5 a month because... We do incur some charges, but there is absolutely no maximum on the program. So what I thought I'd do, uh, Ryan, is go over a little bit how we're doing on the PAC plan since convention. At the end of convention, some of you will recall that if we would have sustained the program at the levels to which we had climbed, we would be bringing in about $523,000 a year on the PAC plan. Well, we haven't quite hit that in actuality because after convention, some people go off the plan and some people reduce their amount. And we've seen certainly some negative effects from the pandemic. But anyway, if we start with current figures right now, uh, we're bringing in $42,578.41 a month. Wow on the PAC plan. Yes, sir. And if you do that over a whole calendar year, that means the PAC program would bring in over $510,000 a year. That's a lot of money the Federation knows how to use. Absolutely. And right now, Ryan, we have 1,543 contributors on the PAC plan. I would have said individuals, but it's not all individuals because... Chapters can give on the PAC plan. Divisions can give on the PAC plan. Affiliates can give on the PAC Couples plan. Couples can give on the PAC plan. Families can give on the PAC plan. And we should, I suppose, Ryan, tell people how, if they're not already on the plan, how they can get on the plan. Oh, pick me, pick me. First, <laughs> you should go to nfb.org slash PAC. That's P-A-C. And you can fill out a form and you can tell us who you are and how much you want to increase, or if you want to start new, how much you want to give. And then one of our friendly operators will call you back and take your bank information for you. Or you can call 1-877-NFB, the number two, PAC, and you can leave a message for our friendly operators who will also call you back. And also, Ryan, if people have questions, they can also send us an email at PAC, P-A-C, at nfb.org. So to conclude this report, uh, I think what we should do, Ryan, is uh, go over some of the top states. Here it is, the top 10. And you know this state, Ryan, I do believe. Mm -hmm. It is Nebraska. I've been there a time or two. Nebraska or at one thousand seventy-six dollars or for and zero cents. Twenty-four months. years. Number nine, Texas, at one thousand fifty-six dollars and zero cents a month. Number eight, but Texas is being outdone by the state of misery. I mean, Missouri mm. is mm. what I meant to say, at one thousand. What uh, three hundred ten dollars a month on the PAC plan? The land of 
potatoes, Idaho is at $1,315 a month. Number six at $1,503 a month, Louisiana. There we right. go. Number four at $1,559 a month on the PAC plan, California. Number four, my native land at $2,136 a month on the PAC plan. Good job, Ryan. Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you. No applause, please. Number three is... Virginia at $2,244 a month on the PAC plan. Now, you can't touch this state. There's just no way you ever will. It's number two, Rocky Mountain High, Colorado, $3,903 a month on the PAC plan. Do I need to mention the number one state? It would be good. They Uh, are giving a fair bit to the PAC plan. Yeah, they really are. They're giving $5,738.56 a month. Maryland. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been your Pac-Men with your Pac Report, and we're out. Thank you very much, Scott and Ryan, for that report. Uh, I really appreciate it. I don't know if they'll be making a cameo in the upcoming uh, Ready Player Two book, but they're, they're ready uh, to keep uh, packing it in. I appreciate all our contributions to the PAC program. Hope there'll be uh, some of you out there that'll decide to join us on the PAC plan here in the month of October. And we're talking a lot about fundraising over these past few minutes, but it's important because um, we have been doing a lot of extra work across the nation and that takes dollars. Uh, uh, Scott picked on the great state of Missouri and our Missouri affiliate, but I do want to give a special thanks to our Missouri affiliate for uh, recently sending us uh, 50% of a bequest that came. It was a nice six-figure check to our national organization to support our work. So thank you to the National Federation of the Blind of Missouri for your generosity in supporting the work of blind people, not just in that state, but all across the nation, including Colorado, even though they pick on you. Hey, uh, we are selling NFB branded masks at our independence market, and many of you have already pre-ordered them. We still do have a limited number left. I encourage you to get them quickly. I do believe they will be gone sold out before the month of October is out. For those of you who did pre-order, you can expect in a week or so, uh, we will have those in-house and we will start um, fulfilling those orders. So be watching for that to happen soon. And I'll look forward to Federation is posting pictures, wearing your uh, NFB branded mask around during Meet the Blind Month. Sorry, we couldn't get them here just a little earlier, but they are on their way and get them while you can. I do have just a few Federation family notes before we get into some Q&A. And uh, uh, the good news is it's all good news this uh, month. I wa- I'm happy to announce and congratulate Stephanie and Brian Baldwin of Colorado, uh, who are now the proud parents of Liam Brian Baldwin, who was born on August 18th weighing in at six pounds, five ounces. I'm told everybody's doing well. I hope that Liam is tuned in this evening. I actually got this note right during the last presidential release saying that Liam was tuned into his first presidential release on September 1st. So pretty good Federation streak there. Uh, Liam, welcome to the National Federation of the Blind. Also, Norma Crosby from Texas reports that Harry and Tambra Staley are now the proud parents of a baby girl. Avery Grace Staley was born on September 12, weighing in at five pounds and 15 ounces and was 18.5 inches tall. Everybody's doing fine. And I should note that Harry serves as president of our San Antonio chapter. So welcome to Liam 
and Avery as the newest members of the National Federation of the Blind and congratulations to the proud parents. I think those are the things I have to report on this presidential release. Pam, back to you. All right, as always, we are busy in the National Federation of the Blind. Thank you so much, President Riccobono. And I'm glad you mentioned those, the update on the mailing of the masks. We've had a couple of questions come through tonight. People are eager and ready to get them. So thanks for that update. I wanna just remind everybody really quickly before we open it up for our questions that remember everyone is muted. So if you have a question, you can put it in the Q&A section or you may email C Danielson, that's C-D-A-N-I-E-L-S-E-N at nfb.org. And thanks to everybody who submitted the questions. Before we jump in, I wanna give our poll update. Uh, thanks to everybody who participated in our poll tonight. So our question for the poll was of the following options, what is the number one thing that you wish that people who aren't blind would understand? So uh, for our responses, 16% of our respondents said that, no, I don't know your blind friend or relative. We don't all know each other. We had 3% of respondents say that the only instrument they could play is the stereo. 46%, the vast majority, said, of course, I can get home by myself. I got here. And close by our second place top finisher was with 22% was, yes, social distancing applies to me. And um, finally, 14% of participants said, actually, the Braille signs our instructions from the mothership for our eventual global takeover. So thanks everybody for participating tonight in our poll. It's always great to hear from everyone. So our- Number five would do better, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, we were taking bets, so. <laughs> um, so our first question, and again, we have great questions. So thank you so much, everybody. We are gonna do our best to answer all the questions that we have, but we, we can't get to every one tonight. So remember, if your, your question is not answered, don't worry, we will be following up. Our fabulous communications team is, will take care of that. So our first question is comes to us from our first vice president of our deaf blind division, also from the state of Pennsylvania, from Marsha Drenth. Good evening, President Riccobono and fellow federationists. My question this evening is about deafblind individuals requesting accommodations for all live events. Will there be put into place a policy or procedure for all communications for requesting card or captioning? Thank you for this opportunity to ask the question tonight. Great, thank you, uh, Marcia, for that question. And I, I appreciate it. You know. Um, we uh, continue to um, look to, in this case, our National Deafblind Division for leadership on um, best practice, what we need to do, and how we innovate to go even beyond uh, what the law requires, which has always been our standard. Now, for a number of years, we have had an accessibility policy uh, that uh, makes it clear that um, we seek to exceed the standards for accessibility in all of our meetings. And we have internal procedures at the national level for um, tracking and making sure that um, we can provide the services that are needed so that every member can fully participate. We are currently in the process of um, developing a model um, policy and practice guidance for each of our affiliates because we know that, um, well, number one, it's something that some affiliates have struggled with more than others. And uh, we know that what happens in one affiliate um, reflects on all of our affiliates in the Federation. And um, there's a complex set of issues when we're talking about accessibility and how do we make sure that everybody gets the resources they need and how do we have that interactive process to make sure we do it in a way that's authentic to our organization and utilizes our resources. So that is coming and we're going to continue to look to the elected leaders of our deafblind division 
Marsha and the rest of them to, to make sure that we get it right. And when we don't get it right, we're gonna to continue to tweak it. This is probably a good opportunity to uh, mention that we do have a number of career openings on the website at nfb.org. One of them is what we're calling a talent development coordinator position. And uh, that position is going to have uh, in it um, dealing with some of these issues and helping to guide our affiliates. So I know some of our affiliates are um, already working on this uh, and have been asking for more guidance. It is coming. We're working on it and we're expecting it to be in place very soon. And then, of course, we'll have to socialize it and make sure people have the resources to make it happen. Excellent. Thank you so much. And just a reminder, we mentioned this at the kickoff as we were getting ready to start, but we are testing out stream text tonight and the link for that is in the chat. For those who are interested, it's a way to access captioning at your own pace. So just we appreciate the input of our deafblind division on that as all well also. So, um, okay, yeah, President. Um, uh -huh. uh, you know, we, we have been providing captioning and uh, we're getting great feedback on the captioning. But as we've continued to work with our deafblind members, um, we've learned um, why the approach we were taking maybe wasn't the best approach overall. So we're trying this new approach and we're looking forward to getting feedback on piloting this. We're gonna to continue to seek out the best solutions that work for the broadest possible group as we deliver these virtual events and as we come back together in person. So. Uh, members of the Federation are always critical in um, informing what happens in our organization. Right, definitely about inclusivity and problem solving. So thank you so much. So we have another question, President Riccobono, from Mark Tatter, who's our first vice president and our Nevada affiliate. And Mark is curious about this. He, uh, Mark says that in various meetings in which he's involved, many disability advocates become focused on people first language. And he's wondering about our position on this. Pam, I think you've been, uh, you know, shaking down the first vice presidents around the country for a question. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, we represent. <laughs> well, this is a good, great question. I guess uh, in terms of our position, I would refer you to the 2020 uh, banquet speech, um, which, which also uh, references the um, resolution that we had long ago about um, this topic. You know, um, our notion has been in this organization and our movement that we should define the language that makes sense for us. You know, we use the word blind to describe any person who has significant vision loss. And that makes a lot of people nervous um, because they say, well, I'm not blind, I can see a little bit. And we have pushed the idea that we get to define what blind means. And uh, blind is, uh, we don't wanna divide the class of blind people. And uh, we have defined the idea that it's respectable to be blind. And so it, if it's okay to be uh, a person that's described with other characteristics, it's respectable to be a blind person. And um, if you know where the person first language has really come from, it hasn't been from people with disabilities. Now, in the disability movements for a while, um, our notion of um, that, that it's okay to not use person first language um, was really rejected. And what has happened across disability as identity first language has now come to the front. And we still have a lot of work to do to educate people on why that's okay. You know, my wife, Melissa and I, we did a training for uh, teachers in Baltimore city schools and um, special educators who, you know, they, it, they, it was drilled into them in their university classes that they had to use person first language. And we talked about uh, why our approach is different, why it, it's respectable, why it's meaningful. And um, it's getting people to understand that just because you're using particular words, if they're not followed by actions that are meaningful, then the nice words 
don't mean anything. And so uh, this is our point of view. We can change our point of view as a movement, but that's where we've come from. I think we should continue to be respectful of folks that decide they want to use other language, but I think we should also challenge it. Um, you know, for example, I like to challenge the notion of vision teacher uh, because I don't think they're teaching vision and I don't think they should be. Uh, so I think we should be critical about the language we use, make sure that we're choosing the words that reflect the meaning and belief that we had. Uh, and if you want more on that, just read the banquet speech. <laughs> <laughs> a great one it was. <laughs> so, all right. Thank you, sir. Our next question comes to us from Patricia Maddox, and she's interested in learning more about what we in the National Federation of the Blind are doing to help accessibility and in insulin pumps. We know so many of our members are diabetic, and we appreciate the work of our, of our Diabetes Action Network. And um, Patricia says that so many of the new pumps are entirely touchscreen. And so how are we in the National Federation of the Blind working on insulin pump accessibility and also apps for monitoring blood sugar levels? Yeah, so this is a great question and one that is very important to us. We've had a number of resolutions over um, the recent years uh, about this topic. It's an exceedingly complex topic because um, the area of medical devices, um, you have a lot of different agencies, federal government that are touching them in terms of um, how, what uh, the certifications they get to come to market and that sort of thing. And then the interplay with insurance. Oftentimes when there are accessible devices, um, the insurance companies uh, don't cover the accessible devices, they cover other devices. And so we as blind people, have to do a lot of work to get our insurance companies to cover the devices that actually do work. So we do have a, a work group that is um, evaluating this, looking at strategies for how to tackle this problem, both on the regulatory and legal side, but also on the manufacturer and um, product side. Anil Lewis, who's executive director of Blindness Initiatives is uh, coordinating this group along with our advocacy and policy team. And of course, our Diabetes Action Network. And I know it's very important to that national division. And I know that um, our uh, new president in the Diabetes Action Network, Debbie Wonders, very excited to, to work on this. So uh, we don't have all the answers um, to this. It is exceedingly complicated. And of course, we are also trying to advance legislation in the Congress to uh, great create um, stronger requirements for accessibility. That is so far an uphill battle, but we believe that medical devices um, in and amongst the accessibility we're pushing for are of the utmost importance. So what I would encourage you to do if you want to get involved is get into involved with our Diabetes Action Network. That's the best way to plug into the resources and conversation. And if you have ideas about what we can and should be doing, uh, I, to use a bad pun, to move the needle on this, uh, we need them. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. And our next question is from Andrew Straw. And Andrew is wondering what we in the National Federation of Blind, how can we work to change the legal profession so we can get more blind judges? That's a great question. Also, um, you know, we could start rolling out the lawyer jokes now. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's an interesting question um, because, uh, you know, our organization has um, fought over many, many, many decades to get more blind people into the legal profession. In fact, there are enough blind people now in the, in the legal profession that there's mostly jokes about however, where you turn, there's a blind lawyer. And um, when you meet with kids in our, in our youth programs, um, you know, being a blind lawyer, that's old news. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, they, they figure there's tons of them out there. I wanna do something. I don't wanna do a stereotypical job for blind people like being a lawyer, which is, is kind of funny. Um, but there is more work to be done in this area. And again, um, to highlight our national division, 
Our National Association of Blind Lawyers, headed by Scott Labar, has been doing a great job of getting blind people um, into more places in the legal profession. Scott Labar, in particular, has led the charge for uh, getting blind people into and noticed in the American Bar Association. In fact, he is the first blind person who served on their uh, ABA Board of Governors. Uh, the division and our blind lawyers are undertaking a number of projects in this area, not just to educate judges, but also to um, help find ways to get people with disabilities more into the pipeline to be judges. So I know that um, the division is working with the National Judicial College and uh, is pursuing other projects. So if you're interested in helping with this, I mean, there is a lot of work to do here. Uh, we get a call almost every week about um, things that judges say, uh, discriminatory actions judges take um, because they don't have an understanding of blindness. And if we can get more blind people into the uh, judge seats, that would help. Get involved with our National Association of Blind Lawyers. You can find them on our website. And um, I'm sure Scott will be happy to put you to work uh, trying to help move this forward. And um, I would encourage blind people out there to shoot to be judges. Um, it, it, it would be great to have uh, more blind people uh, providing rulings from their authentic experience as blind people. That is for sure. Um, now we have another question from Chris Meyer. And uh, this relates to autonomous vehicles. So Chris is wondering about any progress on partnerships we have with automotive manufacturers and the PAVE partnership on self-driving vehicles. Any updates? Yeah, so um, PAVE is the Partnership for Automated Vehicle Education. And this is uh, uh, an organization that we were part of the founding of in order to help educate the public about um, the value of autonomous vehicles. We continue to work with a number of the technology and automobile um, companies out there. I mean, you also have companies like Toyota that uh, now says it's not a car company, it's a mobility company. And we continue to work both on the policy side and the um, partnership side with those organizations. Um, you know, first and foremost, um, there's still a lot of um, unanswered questions about automated vehicles and how they're gonna be deployed. And uh, COVID has um, both introduced some opportunities for testing with those vehicles, um, but also some barriers to uh, both manufacturing and um, building technology and involving blind people in that. So we're continuing to press on companies on how we can be more involved in the testing. A lot of these companies are still um, thinking about these vehicles in terms of what's underneath the hood and not necessarily what's going to be the user experience inside the vehicle, but we um, have gotten their attention. And uh, we're coming up to the 10th anniversary of our blind driver challenge. Uh, and um, that was really the thing that got blind people noticed in terms of autonomous vehicles and putting us at the center of that discussion. And we've made a great amount of progress over that 10 years. We need to do more. Uh, maybe, maybe we even need to partner with one of these companies to get our own autonomous vehicle and do our own research and interface building um, to show them uh, what might be effective for blind people. So we're still exploring that. Um, like everything else, that industry has slowed down a little, uh, but there still will be many opportunities. And I think you'll see some interesting things coming in the future. I don't have any specifics on projects, but um, we continue to be fully engaged with um, a range of companies and, and as well, the Department of Transportation. You're gonna see some stuff from us uh, about an initiative that the Department of Transportation has initiated for 
innovations in uh, transportation technology. And we really think they missed the mark in terms of ensuring that proposals around innovation about people with disabilities include people with disabilities. So we're gonna be calling on um, researchers who are putting in project proposals that impact blind people to involve the National Federation of the Blind. So we'll need everybody to help amplify that in um, the time coming up. Excellent. Um, so our, we have another question here from Tina Hansen. And Tina's wondering about our plans for the year ahead. It's, we are continuing to do many things virtually and there are still a lot of unknown questions about our events for 2021. How are we thinking ahead about that? Well, we are thinking about it. We're having conversations about it. We're um, having conversations about our Washington seminar and our convention next year. Um, I think what, <laughs> and I'm sure Pam will agree with this. I think what we learned over the last six months is it's uh, extremely hard to predict uh, month to month. And, uh, you know, we have three months left in this year. Um, that's going to bring a, a lot of change. So we're continuing to um, plan ahead and evaluate um, our contingency plans. Uh, we want to be um, conservative and um, careful uh, about how we execute events. We also want to make sure that we continue to leverage the technologies to bring more blind people, more participation into our organization. So um, as part of that, we've been um, looking at how we're going to continue to support our affiliates with technology resources. We've also been looking at our membership policies to make sure that we can clearly um, help our affiliates manage um, systems like voting, membership tracking going forward. So those discussions are happening, uh, trust me, every day. Um, we don't have specifics on everything because we're, we're being very measured about it. And um, we need input from members about what we can and should be doing, especially as we at some point move into an environment where we may, may have some virtual participation as well as some in-person participation. It's important to us not to have um, a class system where the virtual folks can't uh, participate as actively as others. So there's a lot of interesting questions there. Everybody's now exploring those questions. I don't think we have any more insight than others, but um, I continue to be inspired by the ideas, the creativity of federationists who are um, raising uh, innovative ideas about how we can manage and um, execute our mission going forward. We have our, our creativity and our resiliency in the National Federation of Line always, always in action. So, um, so President Riccobono, we're um, curious, what are, what are the Riccobonos going to be for Halloween? <laughs> we, haven't, uh, we haven't worked out all of the plans. Um, there's a lot of um, jokes about what people are going to be so far. Um, so we haven't, we haven't quite plan that out. Um, I am wondering what trick-or-treating is going to be like. Um, if you have to, you know, stand back and hold up a target to have the candy shot at or something. I have threatened to uh, get an air gun to shoot candy to trick-or-treat. <laughs> that would be fun. So we've been talking about it. We haven't really, uh, we haven't really mapped out what our, what our uh, costumes are going to be. Well, well, we'll look forward to hearing about that um, in our next presidential release. But uh, I want to thank everybody again for our questions tonight. I know it's a busy time in the National Federation of the Blind. We have our Meet the Blind Month activities, as we talked about, and so many conventions are have been happening in the month of September, like ours was in Louisiana. And we have so many in October and November scheduled in the weeks ahead. So it's, it's always an exciting time organization as we come together in our state affiliate. So we, again, President Riccobono, thank you so much for your leadership and for the example that you set for all of us. And we send our best to Melissa and the kids, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Pam. Appreciate that. I, I'm looking forward to seeing what the uh, LCB Halloween plans are going to be. Yep. 
Uh, <laughs> They've been pumpkin carving already. There you go. There you go. Part of our Meet the Blind Month activities. <laughs> And congratulations again to the LCB on uh, 35 great years. I'm looking forward to, to what's coming up. I want to remind everybody that we will be back together for presidential release live on November 1. So, uh, you know, you can bring your costume the next day. And uh, I'm sure we'll have lots of interesting things to talk about. I hope everybody continues to stay safe and uh, stay smart and uh, I look forward to hearing the stories about the Great Meet the Blind Month activities as well as fall conventions that are going to be happening. I know I'm going to three conventions uh, this month alone, so I'm looking forward to that. And uh, thank you to each and every one of you for the work that you do to build this movement and make it what it is every day. Before we close, though, we should have some of the customary endings. Let's go build the National Federation of the Blind. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Brunner and I'll be telling you a joke. Did you hear about the fire at the circus? No, no I didn't hear about that. It was intense. <laughs> Hi, my name is Austin Riccobono. And what's the ratio of a pumpkin's circumference to its diameter? Mm, what? Know. Pumpkin pie, oh, I like the eye, like the math thing. Hi, my name's Oriana Riccobono and I have a joke. Why are cats afraid of trees? Why? Why? Because they're scared of the bark. How do you stop an astronaut's baby from crying? Your rocket. The preceding message was brought to you by Mark Riccobono, President, National Federation of the Blind, Office of the President at nfb.org. 410-659-9314, www.nfb.org. Let's go build the National Federation of the Blind.